listen, I'm just fed up with the electoral college here in the United States. Yep. And it's got to go. I, I know that you, my compatriots, my fellow countrymen are fed up as well. And we need a new system. The electoral college is outdated. It was made hundreds of years ago when we were spread out in a small set of colonies with representatives that barely represented us then, never mind now when there are hundreds of millions of us. So I brainstormed a new, more universal, truthful way to get the candidate that really represents us in office. And I came to the conclusion that we need to have a Mortal Kombat tournament. Not an actual fight to the death, but each candidate will nominate their champion and they will play Mortal Kombat in a tournament and whoever champion wins that tournament gets to be president yeah so let us know that i'm right because obviously nobody could possibly disagree with this system see here's it's the thing. perfect here's the thing max we made this as a very stupid joke originally and then we excuse me well okay it's become a legitimate <laughs> political option at this no point. we we did joke it was just like what if we just did that and then i'm like would that be, be <laughs> necessarily more undemocratic than the Electoral College? Is it more or less representative than it is currently? And I think we have decided that it actually, I don't know, I don't know Max, it, you would have to, you would have to uh, nationalize video game consoles, first of all, um, so that people could participate in our legal system that is now entirely run by Mortal Kombat. <laughs> um, but also, aside from that, I think if you manage to do that, which that's a tough sell, but if you manage to do it, I think that could maybe work, you know. And as we, I was saying before, the best <laughs> Mortal Kombat player, at least at time of recording in the world right now, is a wonderful non-binary person by the name of Sonic Fox, who endorsed Bernie Sanders for president. So, sure gives us a lot better <laughs> odds than, than the, the current DNC. hellscape yeah. that... We were living in at the moment. Who keeps the DNC being Raiden, bringing Hillary and Biden back up from the dead again to lose for the ninth time in a row. Uh, but yeah. Oh boy. Did we have a transition into the episode from that? I think so. There was. What was it? I, th I think it's mainly just because that reality is such a fucking hellscape. Sometimes you want to escape back to the innocent mind of a child and accept fantasy in a wonderful, magical world that you can escape to. That's a good point. Like the film that we're watching today on the Spectator Film Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And today we're watching La Belle et la Paix, or The Beauty and the Beast. Um, do you want to pronounce that more French? No. That's as French as I'll go. I do think it is La Belle et la Bette. I, I don't think you, you have to... You don't, you don't pronounce hard T's in French. Okay. You know what? I think you're right. Duolingo has yelled at me for that numerous times. You know so. what? I should know better. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to go. I, I'm too embarrassed. But, yeah, we're doing the uh, the original film adaptation of Beauty and the Beast. Um, Quick thing. Uh, not the original, I learned in my research. But this is... I mean, as far as most Whenever people... Whenever I make a statement about something, I'm like not even... Like, I'm 1% not sure about, like, you're just like, actually, I found out that that's not true. I'm just like, God damn it. But the thing is, you are correct, pragmatically speaking, only like if someone was listening to this is like, oh, this is the first one. It isn't the first one, but it's like the first really meaningful one as far as I can tell. That doesn't mean there aren't movies like this that are maybe similar, that are like, you know, not important that came out beforehand, transformation movies, things like that. Um, but... Uh, as far as Beauty and the Beast itself is concerned, this you're correct. This is the first meaningful adaptation yeah. for sure. Uh, and, and your choice. Yes. Oh, my God. I've been fighting and screaming and wanting to do this movie forever. And it's not like Austin was like, oh, I don't want to do this. It we did try to do it before. Yeah. Yeah. It's just scheduling conflicts and this movie would be easier to do right now. And I want to do research for this. So can we not do this immediately? And... Oh, and sometimes it was just like, I'm in the mood for something dumb. Can we not <laughs> do this today? Yeah, this is, uh, just in case it wasn't clear from our introduction, um, I, I assume a lot of people yeah. who might listen to the show would be familiar with this movie already. This is one of those film 101 type movies that I think is like a monolithic type art house movie. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite like Bicycle Thieves, but in the same sort of stratosphere. Yeah. Bicycle Thieves, this, Rashomon, all movies that helped inaugurate the post-war film culture that started in around the fifties. 
So it's a big movie to prepare for. Made by Jean Cocteau, yes. who is a very interesting figure who we'll be getting into later. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting you say that because most of those film 101 movies I've seen so many times I'm bored out of my fucking skull of them. And while I can appreciate what they did for film and the techniques used in them, like the back of my hand at this point, I have no need to rewatch them for pleasure. This movie, on the other hand, I never saw in any film class. I never heard it mentioned in any film class. I only discovered it the last two years, I want to say. I was feeling nostalgic for actually the the Disney one. I was pining over the days where I was allowed to, mainly cartoons and musicals were still a thing and you don't have hand-drawn animation anymore and musicals are either cats or non-existent take your pick of which is better but i was waxing nostalgic before disney controlled all entertainment and they just made wonderful hand-drawn animated cartoon musicals um i was thinking of beauty and the beast which i think is the best of the disney renaissance films um and i saw this referenced somewhere and i saw i believe it was just a still of the beast's just costume and outfit. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, Oh, that's interesting. And that looks really good for the forties. Like Jesus Christ. (laughs) Um, so I looked this up and old, old movies are relatively easy to find dubiously online. So I watched it that night and I was just kind of taken away by this movie. Like it does ask you to literally suspend your disbelief in the opening title crawl but it didn't need to do that i was just sort of like the flow of the movie and just like the dreamlike quality of everything kind of just sort of takes you away and it swept me away and i just like kind of loved this movie after that it was also relatively not i discovered it shortly after the shape of water came out but like it's sort of that same kind of vibe of just like it's a different imagining of beauty and the beast story not in the same drastic way that shape of water does it, but like, right. It's it's a a story that like has about romance, but with the other (sighs) at its core in a specific way. The more I learned about John Cocteau, the more I understood why I felt that way about it and why the movie sort of plays that way to me. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of, it's a beautiful, surreal, eh, surreal, telling of a classic fairy tale that was invented for dubious at best reasons. Yeah. And I think the fact that you can take a tale as old as time, dare I say, and turn it into this piece of art is really quite amazing. And I don't think it's diminished my appreciation for the Disney version. Um, which actually was the that's one of the closest films Disney has ever come to winning best picture. But, um, it, it helps it put into context of just like, Oh wow. They set the stage for so many things in this film that I loved back in the day. And it introduced me to a pretty new filmmaker from my standpoint. I don't know much about Cocteau Mm -hmm. and he's a fascinating character to learn about. So, I've been really excited to do this movie for a while now, and I'm really glad that we finally get the time to do it. Yeah, and it is it is a challenging movie to talk about. We talk about Jean Cocteau as this um, specific figure in relation to this movie because he's the type of... I mean, I guess we we should introduce people to him, although even that conversation does feel bizarre because somehow it seems like when you start to engage with this movie, at least at this point where we are with the internet and everything. And the fact that you're just not going to watch this movie randomly in a theater, you're probably not going to walk in randomly watching this. Um, you're going to be aware of Jean Cocteau and his like, I don't know, status, at least as a specific type of auteur as you're watching this movie, even for the first time, even if you know nothing else about it, I think. And that's because of who Jean Cocteau is as a sort of artist that is bigger than the cinema. Even if this might, in certain people's estimation wind up being one of his more meaningful, uh, artistic contributions and legacies. Um, he was somebody who was totally, he was prolific. He wrote 
books. He did lots of poetry. Uh, he wrote plays. He wrote certain movies, and then he directed several movies as well. And, um, yeah, he's somebody who is an interesting biographical figure, but it matters for the discussion of this movie because of the way this movie exists in relation to his biography, which we'll talk about throughout the commentary in more detail, but it is a specific procedure of filmmaking for sure. No, it, it relates to, and just to give you guys a tantalizing taste, like it gives you, it relates to world war two, it relates to queer theory, which is really what like drove me to want to explore this movie. It relates to so many different things. Um, Mm -hmm. but, and also another reason I wanted to do it this week is we're still all in quarantine. Yeah. And like we said before, Bernie Sanders has just, uh, ended his campaign. Um, things are looking kind of bleak here in the U S and what a time to just sort of slip into a wonderful childlike fantasy world and temporarily (laughs) let the outside melt away. Sure. And also I just, I don't know. I, uh, I guess I should talk about my experience with this movie. I, uh, I think I've owned this movie now for close to 10 years. This was probably one of the first, um, criterion (laughs) movies that I bought, uh, just because it's, you know, recognizable story. Right. And it's interesting to watch this movie because it is the type of uh, movie now that we watch and sort of like, I don't know, it, it feels more like it has this art house reputation, um, which is not quite the same as when it was released. But it plays as something that still maintains an appeal for broad audiences while still retaining a very strong stylistic hand from uh, both the director and other collaborators involved in the project. And that makes it very engaging to watch, I think. And that's just combined with Cocteau's general approach, which is very specific. And I think that's, that's a big part of why this movie is as like, I don't know, kind of mystifying and, and sort of, um, perpetually elusive, I guess you could say in how you try to engage with it. Uh, because Jean Cocteau made movies in such a specific way. So when I saw this for the first time, uh, again, almost 10 years ago, um, I was a big fan of it immediately. I, uh, I sought out a bunch of Cocteau's other movies and most of them are really good. In fact, I would say this is, I don't know how I would rank them, but this is definitely not my favorite movie of his. My favorite of his is Orpheus. Um, so he's a, he's a really neat filmmaker, I think. And definitely in terms of how he, organizes his filmmaking process. I think that's a big, big part of the sort of tone and atmosphere that you get from watching this movie and why it's so effective. And uh, that's something that I've always returned to for this movie is just the design is amazing. um, And in the sort of control of tone atmosphere and I don't know, the sort of affective feeling that those things have on you while you're watching it. Uh, is sort of Affective intoxicating. Is a good way, <laughs> yeah. Because it. It, it just sort of, um, I don't know, recruits you to to sort of participate in it in a very interesting way, as he will explicitly state in the intro of the movie. But I do, I am glad you chose this movie because this is just again one of those one of those big movies, and I think um, again it's something we haven't really covered as much on the show. And there's not many filmmakers quite like Cocteau. I guess he's very specific in what he tries to do, um, which also makes it harder to maybe, uh, abstract and understand how those things work in a subtextual way because he's so specific. It can sometimes feel very convoluted and, but in a sophisticated way, there's lots of overlapping layers of meaning, but that's, that's part of his design, I guess. And, um, doing a lot of research for this movie. I have so many sources people. If you check the show notes, you're going to get more sources than you can possibly bear. I'm so sorry. You're going to be so sourced out. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Um, So doing research for this movie was a challenge because of how much scholarship exists on Cocteau just outside of his movies, right? And his life in many ways sort of preceded the work he made. So he's kind of like Oscar Wilde in a certain sense where he's like, I'm going to make my life this weird performance art situation. Lord Byron to a degree. (laughs) Yeah, I guess sort of the similar... Yeah, a similar sort of performative 
persona mm-hmm. that they're yeah. it, like invoking and everything. He's very big on personal mythology, which he mixes with Greco-Roman mythology. He's like a mythopoeic filmmaker, but he combines that with his own biography. Um, so it's sometimes challenging to articulate the subtextual things that are going on in this movie apart from that. So a lot of the sources that I'll, I'll link to, they're very insightful, but sometimes they're frustrating to read because you're like, I am trying to understand this and they just keep referencing things that are not related to the movie, but related to like some biological thing from his diary. And it's like, Oh God, I don't understand. But aside, I, once you work through it, I think it kind of makes sense. And before we begin, I do kind of want to go through one basic thing about the mizzen scene of this movie and Cocteau's process, because I think it can be kind of mystifying. And there's so many things to discuss in the movie itself that it's probably worth it to get out of the way right now. Yes, sir. So that thing is going to be really describing what is special about Cocteau's sort of practice of filmmaking, the way he runs a set and how he wants things to go. And uh, it's very specific. And I think there also might be a sort of like language barrier that makes it harder to potentially understand in English. Um, But I think a very useful comparison is to think of the way he shot movies as a sort of seance photograph and seance photography. Uh, Lots of people will use the term documentary aesthetic with Sean Cocteau, where when you hear that the first time, you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Uh, And it, it's, I mean, that's justified because it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And what I think they mean is like this sort of seance documentary aesthetic. I don't know if people have used that comparison or that term. I'm just using it right, right now because it's useful for me. But think of it this way. A seance is this thing where you are getting in touch with this mystical realm, this transcendental realm uh, with transcendental, entity, transcendental entities, oh, okay. right? And you are as a group of people holding hands around a table or whatever it is, maybe you have, you know, mystical totems, objects with you that are important. Maybe you have biographical things that are important that give this sort of ritual practice some sort of meaning, right? Uh, But you are participating with one another, holding hands, trying to communicate with this transcendental realm. And then somebody takes a photograph. And even if you don't see something in person, Maybe on that photograph, you see something that you did not see before. You see like a specter or a phantasm, something from this other world that you're trying to make contact with. You were touched by the fantastical, whether you knew it or not. Yeah. And what Cocteau is doing here is sort of similar to that. He's saying in all his movies, not just this one, he's saying, I am going to provide a sort of biographical basis for everything that's going on. So it's honest right? And I'm going to confront my own demons in this biographical way. I'm going to force everyone to participate in this sort of semi-improvisational way, sort of holding hands together in this ritual, right? And I'm going to try to be as straightforward about achieving this apotheosis, a term we'll probably bring up multiple times throughout the commentary. All his movies are about apotheosis, a poetic apotheosis, poetic Um, sort of transcendence. And the idea is if he can successfully do this while in the process of making the movie, when you watch the movie, every time you watch the movie, it's almost as if everyone making it is resurrected again because they have achieved poetry, right? So it is this thing about when you're successfully achieving this poetic effect that he's going after, which is kind of hard to describe. When you watch the film back, you see the specter of poetry in everything that's happening. So that's probably the best comparison to use. And just like a specter, you may not believe it until you <laughs> yeah, experience it for yourself. So I think we should probably get it. Yeah. Go ahead and start the film. Yeah. And Oh, just before we start, definitely agree with you there. If you haven't seen this movie, definitely don't watch it with the commentary track for the first time. I don't know if somebody would do that, but I'm just saying like, it's a very if you're, fun If you're movie. a diehard, like, spectator film podcast fan, we don't have a name for our fans yet. Um, <laughs> if you're one of our diehard fans and just sort of, list, like, watch the movies along with us or just listen to the podcast, this is one of the few that we're going to put the please watch the movie before we ruin it for you stamps on it. Yeah. It, it's worth it. Trust us. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to engage with. And, you know, everyone else is locked down like us. 
Yeah. So you so have plenty of like, times. Stop watching Tiger King for the 18th <laughs> time and watch this instead. You want to see a real Tiger King? <laughs> it's in this movie. It's Sean Murray. Hey. Yeah. All right. Let's begin. Be our guest. No, we're not beginning with that Disney bullshit. The Criterion back, Collection. Back oh. to our old friend, the Criterion Collection. I'm glad we were going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> we're on the same wavelength. That's good. Yes, we still don't know how to talk one at a time, but at least you know we're saying the same thing. <laughs> so you miss nothing. We're like a two-headed gatekeeper. One of us tells the truth and one of us only lies. That's from uh, uh, Labyrinth. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Jennifer Connelly, if you're listening, come punch us. What did she do to get past that? I think she just confused them and then walked past them. Oh, yeah, the liar's paradox. Yeah. And then she fell in the hole of hands. Ooh. I uh, do not like that scene. It's a little bit uncomfortable. But anyway. Uh, Speaking of things that aren't uncomfortable. Look at that dog. Good dog. And here we have uh, Jean Marais and Jean Cocteau himself writing on the chalkboard. What weird fucking credits. Yeah, I've never quite seen a credit scene like this. I mean... It works, but it's just like, oh, okay. However, as you know, Max, I think that this credit sequence is relevant to the film. And I'll be talking about why. It does relate to the thing I discussed right at the tail end of the introduction, where uh, I'm talking about this film as a type of ritual that recurs every time you watch the movie, these people are resurrected for you. This is what John Cocteau wants. This is his thinking going into making this movie. He wants to be resurrected because if you succeed at poetry, you reach that transcendental realm, right? So it's like when I make this movie, we're resurrected from the dead every time, much like a seance photograph, we are resurrected from the dead every time we join hands with the audience. And that's what's going on here in this credit sequence. He is writing on a chalkboard, but then we also get credits coming over that are clearly just from the film. And then he mixes it with stuff he's writing on the chalkboard and then he's erasing things. He's mixing and matching the film with something he's doing in a sort of spontaneous improvisational way on camera. And that's his way of even in just the credits, making this movie feel as if it's something that is improvisational and alive. Well, yeah, it mixes like the polish of post-production with like the reality of like what they're actually filming on set Mm -hmm. sort of like blurs the line between the two, which even outside of your wanting to revive himself and the crew and everybody who worked on it, it works as the central plot of the movie of sort of blurring the lines between reality and fantasy right off the bat, just introducing the people that are making the movie. Yeah. And then on top of that, we have this appeal to the audience. This is obviously or not obviously, but honestly, one of the more famous parts of the movie, this gets referenced almost every time I yeah, read or see anything about it is the title crawl asking the mo- yeah, viewers to suspend their disbelief and sort of occupy the mind space of a child and remember what it was like that you believed without questioning that rose yeah, roses could cause you punishment to a fantastical degree and that castles could be enchanted and a man's heart can dwell within the body of a beast. And it's honestly very nice and I love it. And we need it in our modern culture today. Um, if every movie had this, then cinema sins would be destroyed for the most part. Cause you couldn't just be like, Oh, well why is this fuck off, man? Just calm down and enjoy the movie a little bit. Here's the thing though. I think it e- even is more sophisticated than that. No, you're, you can um, be. I think an important part about that sort of a pe- like, I don't know, pleading with the audience. It reminds me a little bit actually of the final bit of Shakespeare's The Tempest where Prospero makes this appeal to the audience. He says, my magic is very weak. And he asked them to applaud to set him free because he's used all his magic in this final play of Shakespeare. And he's asking to be released from his duty. And um, it's this very interesting thing about audience participation in the live event that is theater, right? And that's sort of what's going on here. We talk about how Jean Cocteau in that way, he, you know, he doesn't consider himself a filmmaker. He considers himself a poet, no matter what medium he's working in, right? And he wants to sort of resurrect the crew and himself and everyone who worked on this movie every time somebody puts the movie on. But part of that, Max, 
is getting the audience to believe too. They have to join hands in the circle, and that means they have to get involved in this process of resurrection by uh, putting our faith into this film, by giving ourselves over to it in that way. Yeah. But here's the thing, Max. It's even more smart than that. Because what is film? Film is an illusion anyway. Film, by its very nature, requires us to give ourselves over to it because you watch something at 24 frames a second. It is an illusion that your body is participating in to get you to make it look like things are happening. None of it is... The medium itself is not there. You are watching something that is totally the specter, right? So for him, film becomes this ultimate poetic tool where you are participating in his resurrection every time you watch this movie and his achievement of sort of poetic apotheosis. Even in just the level of the medium he's working in. So it makes sense. It's this fun aura in the movie and it gets you to sort of, um, I don't know, it's, it's participating in a new type of like myth making by, by sort of gathering around and, and sort of, I don't know, looking at the spectacle of this, of this uh, brilliant sort of production they've put in front of us. Side note, maybe their father wouldn't be so broke if he didn't hire full-time servants to lay around in the barnyard <laughs> to possibly carry his daughters and these things. Oh, I love this, by the way, when the duck comes out from under her dress. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that was a total accident. And Jean Cocteau talks about that for like three paragraphs in his diary, which, mm-hmm. by the way, that's going to be in the show notes. But the diary of the making of this film is pretty great. Uh, it's it's very interesting to read his process. Um, however, it's kind of it, this is like a famously pro- troubled production. We're going to bring yeah. up different details where this was one of the first big movies to be financed post-war in France. And uh they had a very hard time, so there's lots of crazy shit that happened. Uh, other weird detail that stuck with me, everyone started getting boils. It's like, what the fuck? I mean, there was a lot of diseases just, like, floating around after the World War II. Like, I know, but it's like, seriously, this is like every other page. This seems to be happening. So I, they have my sympathy. Boils everywhere. <laughs> But yes, we with those credit sequence, that credit sequence is so interesting that we basically have been talking over this entire opening scene. And uh, you were making reference to whose father, these two uh, evil stepsister types. Yeah. Which, of course, were not in the original story. No, um, no none whatsoever. Or at least the main source text. We should clarify that as far as we mean with original story, we mean the one by like Madame Beaumont. Yes, whatever her name her, is. I was, believe it was... 1774 it, it was in the late 1700s i think it was 60s but it doesn't matter yeah yeah it was a yeah french woman's magazine designed and the story was written for young girls in order to basically make them be okay with arranged marriages that their parents had set up for them the woman who wrote it was a governess and she wrote it yes yeah, like she you said a, she owns a woman yeah owned a woman's magazine but I don't know if it was a specifically magazine. The point, whether or not it was a magazine is relevant. It's, it is about, you're right, teaching these young charges that she has been handed over by aristocratic families to try to educate uh, a certain type of like acceptance of their role in this society and to embrace the marriages that have been arranged for them. Right? Yes. And that... <sighs> Um, you like <laughs> in a very like modern sense of it, it's basically like, yeah, he could look ugly and lash out and just sort of keep you imprisoned and not let you do anything that you want. See your friends or family. But if you're very virtuous and kind, you can change him, which is kind of an ick from a modern point of view. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm also going to source another book, which God damn it. I can't remember the title of right now. Um, but it's about folktale adaptations in cinema and they do have an interesting chapter on this and it's fascinating because it's actually, it goes through the entire tradition of what they call the animal bridegroom. Oh no, there's uh, stories. I know there are so many different ones. Um, it, there's a long history, even going back to the same sort of like Greco Roman mythology that we know that Cocteau is a big fan of as well. Um, and, uh, 
it is this sort of thing where it's about tricking, like basically creating a delusion where it's like, it's not that you are submitting to them. It's that you are virtuous and you put up with their monstrosity because, and that is your vir- virtue and beauty. Yes. Yeah. And because of that, you become rewarded with a beautiful prince at some point. And I, I became familiar with, um, can I interrupt you with a fun detail? See this. You're going to anyway. So well, Max, this relates back to another very fun movie we've done. This is the second time on the podcast that we've seen this image, which was based on, uh, um, Rembrandt's painting, the anatomists, I believe it's called. Do you remember the first time? No. So when Peter Cushing pushed that fucking guy off the railing to murder him, do you remember this? Come look at this painting. And then he pushes him (laughs) off the wall. It's just a fun detail. Another fun detail. Um, my favorite of the, cause I, the animal bridegroom thing is a very common aspect when you're researching this. My favorite one, um, I believe it was uh, Swahili where okay. it's sort of the inverse of this, where the girl decides not to marry sort of, he's not a monster, but he's just like an ugly non-desirable match that her parents had set up for her Mm -hmm. and she decides to go off and marry for love instead and oops it turns out she married a hyena whoops (laughs) as you do so that's like the opposite of beauty and the beast honestly it's like don't marry for love otherwise he'll be a hyena and he laughed and he laughed and he laughed hyenas like the more you learn about them they're such fucking weird creatures but i that's another list of things of things I wish I could have as a pet, but would definitely eat me in my sleep. If we've learned anything the last two weeks in quarantine, let's leave wild animals as wild animals. And we don't even have to bring up what I'm talking about, but you know what? Leave tigers alone, leave lions alone, leave hyenas alone. Yeah. Let them be happy. But yes, we we've been talking over the introduction of Jean Marais and Josette Day, our two leads, Belle and Avanon. Avanon. Um, and this is a very interesting shot too. this sort of wistful, wistful, I don't, I wouldn't want to call it longing, but I didn't know reverence towards the father. Uh, Speaking of weird animals, they, we need to tell the sisters that because they ask for what a monkey and a parrot. I mean, it makes sense. It this, does it, it. It does. We were taught, we didn't mention it yet, but a very interesting part of this is how it begins with this broad commedia dell'arte sort of farcical approach, which is why Cocteau sort of brings in these two evil stepsister characters who were very much not part of the original story and also invents the sort of Avenon character. A lot of this is his invention because he's trying to, um, I don't know, create a certain effect in starting with Commedia dell'arte, but also there's so many things happening at once. We do have to put that conversation on hold for the one thing in this movie that really cannot wait to be discussed about, which is this character that just entered the frame. The, uh, the uh, yikes, 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 yikes. The yikes. Jewish moneylender. How do I know he's Jewish? Well, they don't say everybody, but they also do kind of tell you that he's Jewish. <sighs> so I think now might be a good time to bring up the fact that. So Jean Gocteau lived through the Nazi occupation of France. Not did not just lived through it. He was uh, an active collaborator with the Nazi occupation of France. He, despite very boldly being an openly gay man. He was openly. Yes. I mean, it's not quite as again, not quite the same as in America. Like when you, we say openly gay, that still has some more cultural specificity to it for France at that time. Yeah. But he was openly gay. Um, and Nazi occupied Germany, but also he actively collaborated with them, but also it was like, he, in his diaries, he like would openly fantasize about like Hitler being gay and he bought into Nazi propaganda. He wrote puff puff pieces for, um, I think, I think the famous one, I think the person's name is Arno Becker, the like official sculptor. Yeah. That's a sculptor. Um, there's lots of, he was definitely eager to interact and participate with the Nazis. Um, however, I will say there's a, there is a degree of accepted 
ambiguity about his specific nature of his collaboration with the Nazis, um, which I'm not fully an expert on, but it is worth remembering that there is a certain degree of like ambiguity to that, despite uh, clearly, especially compared to other filmmakers of his generation, the way in which he participated with Nazis to try to get scripts approved or, and everything. Actually, the first really big movie he sort of participated in with Jean Marais, uh, The Eternal Return, I think, I believe it's called, in 1943, the movie that really helped launch Jean Marais' film career as like one of the first big sex symbols in France was something that in many ways can be discussed as something that lends itself aesthetically and perhaps ideologically to the Nazi propaganda project. I believe it's a retelling of Tristan and Isolde, but I think it's really its take on realism is the thing. I could be wrong about this. I could be misremembering. Well, a lot but. of Nazi like <sighs> propaganda or just sort of Nazi art ends up being unintentionally very homoerotic just for how it praises the masculine and strength of the Aryan race. Like Sure. In, like, a, in that sort of homosocial way as well. Yeah. Um, which is something going on in this movie too. We'll be talking about. Um, I mean, they can go both ways too. Like if you look at all the old uh, Soviet union, like especially the ones where it's like, we're allied with China and it's just like a Russian man and a Chinese man holding hands with their like children in the background. You know, I see that on Twitter with like just comrades being comrades. Mm hmm. Um, uh, but, but yeah, so he, he collaborated with them though. Yeah. With Nazis. So, so, and that's a question in this movie because this Jewish sort of money lender character shows up and then he disappears. And then at the same time we get this sort of bourgeois, you know, mythological patriarchal hero of the father who is running along heroically going to make money with his <laughs> merchant ships before fate steals it away. Um, and then going through these scary forests, by the way, those forest bits are terrifically done. The design, of course, in this movie is brilliant. Um, Everything, set design, costume design. Just, yeah, uh, and those forests specifically and that staircase he was running up definitely are based on old Gustave Doré uh, etchings or sketches. I don't know. That went along with different um, book versions of the story, I believe, in the 19th century. Then we get the famous hands here. Of course, you mentioned the amazing design, Max. A lot of this stuff feels very much par for the course with um, Jean Cocteau. A lot of his motifs that he emphasizes in his other movies show up. There's a weird emphasis in dialogue and shots on hands. Yeah. Um, you have these arms in the wall. There's lots of emphasis on statues that are alive and moving. That's a big thing in Cocteau's sort of filmography. Um, and the reverse motion as well yeah. is a big thing with him. Uh, however... Just to point out how amazing the design is, it's worth mentioning another name, and that's Christian uh, Berard. Or is it Gerard? Hold on. I'm going to look that up to confirm. However, the person who was behind the sort of production design and like set design of this movie, um, he, he really played an amazing role, and he also, he also created the outfit. Which, yet again, is the thing that drew me into this movie in the first place. And it is really amazing. I was going to ask you how you felt about it, because a lot of times costumes don't age well, and you can be like, oh, that looked amazing for the time. But, like, even today, like, it's just has a certain kind of quality to it where it's like, I don't know, it's almost... Like when you go to a play and you see somebody in a costume, you're in a different sort of atmosphere because it's a different medium. You have to suspend your disbelief in a different way because you're in Rome in a room and you can see these people and they're on a stage. And yeah. There's it's a different tense. medium. But this movie almost kind of does the same thing where like It's the mizzen scene. Yes. Yeah. It sets the stage in a completely different way. So and it, 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 it relates back to that weird process that he went about trying to achieve the poetic transcendence is that it changed the like machinations of how he would go about making this movie and then also how he wanted to shoot everything. As, and by the way, the name is Christian Berard with a B. Um, so he made not just that outfit. He did all the outfits in a post-war France where they had no resources. 
guy was incredible. He mm-hmm. died shortly after this movie. Um, Probably from selling his soul to the devil to finish that. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny that you would make that joke because he, as well as Jean Cocteau, he also was in one of the more prominent openly gay relationships. Hmm. Yeah, and he, I believe he also did lots of work in in like ballet. I know what you're praising. Art direction. I know what you're praising the set design just now, but I can't believe he ripped off uh, Joel Schumacher's Phantom of the Opera. Oh my this god. Movie. Uh, I haven't seen that movie, but you always talk about how that's like the weirdest reference. Okay, so I talk, we, I, talk, I talk about what... Get, do you want to talk about Phantom of the Opera? Do I want to do an episode on it? Or? No, no, no. While we're watching this movie. I just, like, I get why it's there. Because, <laughs> like, on a very surface level, be- yeah, Phantom of the Opera is a Beauty and the Beast story. And Joel Schumacher wants to prove that he's seen other movies. But, like... I guess it is. It's the only surrealist flourish in the entire movie, and it's really fucking dumb. Is, is Does uh, Gerard Butler singing count as surrealism? If you can count it as singing, he just shouts. Well, they're actually, okay, we joke about how stupid that movie it is and how it's not worth to bring up in terms of <laughs> talking about this really incredible piece of art. Uh, however, th- those are also two other things, and there are two details about it that I think are worthwhile. First of all... Um, the surrealism comparison. A lot of people describe John Cocteau's movies as surreal, but I think this is one of those instances where it can probably more accurately be described as adjacent to surrealism or weird, not really surreal. This is something we talked about in our Un Chien Andalou episode, and uh, Louis Spoonwell gets compared, and him and Jean Cocteau get compared to one another because actually the movie Lodge Door and... Um, Boonwell's first movie, The Blood of a Poet, were financed at the same time by the same person. So they were both part of that Paris 1920s cafe society uh, and were moving in similar circles with one another. So it makes sense that they get compared. They both make weird movies. But Boonwell has a more political project. And for him, art is more of a social thing than Cocteau, for whom it belongs in a more personal realm, at least in terms of how they approach it. And for Cocteau, part of his thing in making movies that feel surreal is that he wants to ride the line in between obscurity and accessibility with his symbolism and his subtext. Because for him, if he creates something that can too easily be accessible, if he creates something with fixed meaning symbols, like what does the rose mean? What's the subtext of the rose? What's the subtext of the smoke coming out of them? If he makes it where the subtext can be too easily fixed to one thing that for him becomes stagnant. Right. But if he goes in the opposite direction towards obscurity and he makes something like surrealism, which is not meant to be understood rationally in in like politically motivated ways, then he makes something that you can't engage with in the way that he wants dead deer, which you told me was apparently the hardest thing in this movie to get a hold of. Yes. There are many there's, they struggled greatly to find a dead deer. Here we finally get the rose. Um, But yeah, movie that rides the line between surrealism and or obscurity and accessibility. Oh, look at the reveal. It is a pretty good reveal. The interesting flicker with the eyes that show up. Look at that fucking, you would steal my roses. The fucking, uh, the posture, the dandy nature. And as is the case with many, with many, uh, insane outfits. This was a huge, huge endeavor just to get into all the time. And Jean Marais suffered in order to do this uh, a great deal. It was a, it was a huge undertaking, but you described him as a dandy. And that goes back to the second point I was going to make about relating this to Joel Schumacher, which is that this movie is very interesting as it relates to, um, I don't know, that sort of gay camp sort of uh, tradition, but also just, the homoeroticism and I guess you could say the queering of the otherwise like the heterosexual romance, which is, that's a big reason I wanted to do this because (laughs) there, as I mentioned before, there's, there's queer elements in the shape of water, but it's more side characters than anything. Okay. Um, But there is sort of this, in all Beauty and the Beast stories, and I'm not just talking about like animal bridegroom stories. Yeah, animal sure. bridegrooms or just 
kind of things like that, like King Kong. Yeah, definitely um, as well. But there's always <laughs> a projected sort of other onto the monster. Yes. In those things. And for a lot of modern film theorists, it's, and viewers alike, it's very easy to project your yeah, project yourself or different communities onto them and relate to the monsters more than you are supposed to relate to the protagonists now. Sure. And less so with, I, I have seen a lot of stuff with this movie because the director cast his boyfriend as both the unwanted, but conventionally attractive male. Avedon. Yeah. Avedon. And then and the beast as well. Yeah. Um, so he is both love interests at the same time. So yeah. He is, Again, he is the only outcome. An example of that biographical material. Yes. He must provide to make the ritual of poetry occur. And <laughs> so if we're, if Bell's our point of view character, then it's, it's gay either way is basically all I'm saying. Um, well, but that's not, <laughs> That's not my point, but it, they're the style of it does definitely lend itself to gay camp, but I'm talking more about just like this style of movie in general where you have, um, you have the romance with the other. Yes. Yeah. Which makes sense in that sort of thing where it's because it is not that idealized heterosexual romance and the fact of having a romance with the other opens the door to questioning and interrogating. I don't know. I don't want to say the validity of the more accepted romance, but it, it opens you past the sort of like taken for granted assumptions. There's a reason why in these stories, like they start out as responding to the monster as monstrous, and then it develops in that way. Um, and I think you can compare it to other romance movies where I think um, a useful sort of, academic approach to evaluating any sort of romance movie, including just normal rom-coms is looking at it as education of one another, where each partner in this relationship in this movie will educate their, their sort of part, their other partner on the proper like gender role. They want them to inhabit in order to actually sort of guarantee a successful union between the two. So it's them educating one another back and forth. And these movies are, very frequently somebody from a more normative position um, sort of receiving an education on embracing the other and moving past taking for granted assumptions. That's a very good way to put it. Um, <laughs> sorry. Well, well, I was about to reference Shrek and we're not doing that in this movie. No, we so. don't have to do that. But I guess that does also count as, as the same type of no, story. It, it's literally yeah. the inversion. Um, but I think... Well, you're talking about with the homoeroticism of it. No. We can compare it to the, not of Shrek, Max. (laughs) Okay, good. Definitely not of Shrek. (laughs) Of this, where we can compare it to the original source text. And think about that one, right? That one is definitely about heterosexual coupling. Yes, 100%. And the validity of that institution. And the monster in that is, is used to try to validate the positioning of, of the heterosexual union. However, in this one, okay, the other thing to mention about that, though, is think of the audience. That's for women, that story. Yes. It's f- served a very basic utility. Now, what's happening here, this is being taken by a man who is, you know, making a biographical movie, and he's very much examining his relationship to John Murray in this movie. And Look at the sparkle horse. Yeah, this horse um, was a nightmare on set. By the way, just another fun fact for you. As all horses are. Um, horses are outdated cars that shit everywhere, can, can kick and bite, and should be killed on sight. That is uh, the Spectator Film Podcast's official stance on horses. Uh, I'm vetoing that. You can you can be the one who holds that opinion. Okay. Um, but anyway, this is a circus horse, which I think works well with the aesthetic. And uh, even though they were insane, I think it... I think it was worth it. it. It still looks good. But yeah, in terms of talking about the homosexual, or I guess you could just say more generally the queering of the romance in this movie, it's very clear that Cocteau is much more interested in the Beast character Oh, 100%. Than Belle. And like, 
it's less about their romance than anything where it's at least the vibe I kind of get from it is the beast is like, okay, we're, we have to be together and I'm sorry that I'm this way. Yeah. But, but like, that's what I am and I'm willing to give you whatever you need and meet you halfway and like try to make you comfortable. I'll meet you more than halfway. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you have to understand that this is what I am and like, that's not going to change. I'm sorry. And it's almost like, it's almost an inversion of the original concept in my eyes where like I kind of read this film as like these two end up in a forced marriage and it's just like, Hey, I'm gay. I'm sorry. Like I'm not going to be able to give you what you want in that way, but like I'll try to make you happy in every other way. And it's an interesting retelling of that story. And I don't see many people talk about it, but as you're saying, it very closely follows the beast character and makes you very, very sympathetic to him early on. Yeah. Uh, A lot of other retellings kind of do try to show him as much more cruel early on to kind of show that like, he's really cruel to the father. Yes. is the thing really the first moment bell arrives, which I mean, what a sequence too. we get the classic Jean Cocteau sort of uh, slow motion. And then she's running through these very abstract, interesting looking sets with the flowing, flowing curtains. This is actually when they, I don't know if they shot it already. The, the person who was financing the movie got cold feet, I think at a certain portion into the production and decided to take their money. And they, I think they showed them that scene to be like, look at what we're doing. And that convinced them to get back on and be confident in the movie. And they were really glad they did because this became a huge hit. And of course, by the way, we, the door just talked to her. It's worth mentioning too how much the uh, the Disney version is just aping off of this one. Um, it is a remake of this one, yes. basically. And I'm not. Listen, you know we at the Spectator Film Podcast love bashing on Disney, but I'm I'm not here to bash on the Disney one. I think it's a very very well made film. I haven't um, seen it in so long that I don't really feel comfortable commenting on it at this point. Cause I just, I don't know, remember. And I just, I don't know. It was the first, uh, musical since the seventies uh, to get nominated for best picture. <laughs> actually. Um, I, I can't remember what the one was, but it definitely didn't win best picture. Oh, this decor is so interesting. The forest intruding into the room. Um, that's, that's a constant theme throughout this though, where you have nature sort of overgrowing all of this fancy pomp which kind of interacts with the beast itself i feel like this movie has been described as surreal gothic is a term that's also been described gothic in the architectural sense yeah um well just the exuberance yes. of everything oh here's another classic jean cocteau motif mirrors done very very cleverly with some trick photography um there's great special effects in this movie just generally and then the the sort of dark sexual connotations of everything that's going on that this movie definitely does not shy away from. Oh, by the way, Freudian. Is it, is it, what do you think? Just as a fun question. What? Is it creepier that the furniture can talk, but doesn't have faces or like, you mean like Alexa? Kind of. Yeah. Well, like compared to what, having a face, making eye contact with the Disney movie where it's just like, Oh, I'm a candelabra. I'm a clock. I'm a feather duster. I'm a cabinet and like, it's fun. I don't know. We're already living in the world where they have voices and could talk to us. Yes. And I hate Alexa and want to throw it against a wall. But if it had an actual mouth, that would be worse. Cause then you could, it could not be saying anything, but it could be like I licking don't its lips. They have those gigantic, like sinister black monolith Roombas that roam supermarkets now for security purposes, but they put googly eyes on them so they don't look dystopian. That just, Have you seen those? Yeah, I know. Um, I think uh, there's, I don't know. There's no proper answer to that question. There's no right way to go. I have seen that a popular thing to do is take uh, four boxes of products and just put them directly around those monoliths because their sensors won't let them run over products. Do you think Bell would have done that in the original one? Yeah. It would be like, I live in a capitalist society. I know how to solve this problem. Well, that was... Was Adam Smith being... No. Adam Smith... I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to 
get into Adam Smith. Whether, whether capitalism was being fully adopted in the 1760s at that oh, point. Oh, who cares? Yeah. Max, it was just a dumb, dumb joke. I know. We don't, don't have to go back and do and our research for this. As is Spectator Film Podcast tradition, I'm going to go into it for way longer than we should. But yeah, we, we were just talking over the real moment where it's clear that the perspective is following Beast. Yes. Where, you know, she passes out. She becomes what many people who comment on this movie would call a tableau vivant. I Which believe. means? It's just, it's like a prop, basically. Yeah. She doesn't have a whole lot of agency until a while later when she's like, can I go see my dad, please? And There's some interesting moments with the agency. It's, again, if you compare it to the source material, especially, where that one is about making you as a woman own your subservience to your husband as if it is your own virtue. Whereas yes. in this one, she clearly expresses lots of displeasure to him at multiple different points. Um, and he accepts the fact that it's his fault. Yeah. And, uh, but that just goes further to speak to how this movie is looking at trying to, I don't know. I feel like problematize is a word that academic people use when they can't think of something more specific, but it is questioning the sort of heterosexual union that this movie is supposed to be adapting to the screen. I don't care though, honestly, because <laughs> I get that if you set out to make this story, you want to make the love story between the two as compelling as possible, theoretically, but also like as a queer person, like it's much more, interesting just kind of like watching this film from the 40s when especially in america none of this was even remotely acceptable and just like being able to kind of feel this energy radiating off the way that the film itself looks at the beast character oh i mean it works yes yeah um it's genuinely despite cocteau yet again being a nazi sympathizer like <sighs> It feels like genuinely genuine queer art from almost 80 years ago, which it is though. Yeah. Like, like it is you, you say it feels like, but it is he, no, but it feels like that's what I mean though. Like yeah. it affects me though. Like, right. Not just like, Oh, did you know this guy was gay and also made this thing? But like it's queer art. Well, and, you mentioned, despite him being a Nazi sympathizer. And again, we mentioned the ambiguity of this. I think any questions we raise about the sort of Jewish presentation of the Jewish character in this should yeah. be under the like umbrella of like, I think it is anti-Semitic. Yes. The way it's shown here. However, there are certain questions you can maybe ask about the ambiguity to get a clearer idea of potentially what was going on. There's a very interesting essay that I'll also link to in the show notes by a guy named Dan Fishlin um, about that. And he, he writes about, you know, how sort of othering works at the time between the comparisons with gay people and Jewish people and how they sort of exist on a continuum. He writes about an excise scene, which I believe they shot about yet another Jewish character who the two young rascals, Avenon and Ludovico, like try to trick into getting money from. And then they performed for him as their sisters to try to make it seem like their sisters love him. And it's very weird. Um, then he finds out and then they beat the shit out of him and like steal his money. Um, and that would have been maybe more interesting as like a linking connection between the othering of the beast in this movie and how yeah. that's shown. And then the othering of the, of the Jewish money lender, which becomes truly anti-Semitic because he sort of seems to come and go and the movie doesn't seem to comment on it at all. He just tricks these young idiot drunkards out of their money, basically. And I mean, the, they are young idiot drunkards, but you can't, I can't get past the way he's dressed. Yeah. Is the thing. If as he could have been, it could have been anything else. He could have just been another person wearing one of those Dutch looking outfits. And you like, might be able to still yeah. like make a case for it being anti-Semitic but it's just the appearance. No, I'm saying like everybody else, I don't know. I just associate those outfits with like the Dutch, but like the, <laughs> the big hats and the, like the long cloaks. So like how the people like from the merchantile things are dressed. Yeah. Just have them dress like that. Have them be another one of those, but no, no, it's, it's deliberately Jewish. And he's yeah. also not in the original story. That's yeah. also Cocteau's invention. And the fact that they had this doubled X I scene with yet another character who they mistake for him because they look so similar is the other detail. 
It's like, what is the implication of this? And I think in this, in this essay, Fishelin, he, he also comes down on the case that this movie does reinforce notions of othering, but the way in which he discusses it is very interesting. And there is like an ambiguity there that like is kind of worth digging into. And he talks about too this, this idea of Cocteau trying to break the signifying chain between his own queer othering and like the Jewish queer othering. Well, that's, that's a thing that happens in a lot of, uh, right wing circles. And I wanted to talk about this. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to think about it because I think I brought this up to you yesterday, but like, it's sort of like as certain groups are accepted more and more in a given community, people who don't like them will accept token members of them to put into their group until it becomes socially acceptable to excommunicate them again. And you can get farther and farther down the chain. So I'm wondering, was Cocteau the Milo Yiannopoulos of the Nazis (laughs) occupying France at the time? I mean, was he just like, Hey, I'll support you guys and give you art and help you out. As long as you don't hate me for being queer and I'll, hate the Jews along with you. And it's just like, is it, if that's true, (laughs) like, does that diminish this incredible work of art? Well, the thing is, even this was made after. Yeah. Where if anything, I think there's evidence. He also, after the war made efforts to clear his political reputation. So even though people like to talk about him as this, like, you know, kind of dandy, um, you know, salon occupying a political artist yeah. as if he's like, he's so he's too simple for this world. He's too pure for this world. Max, he's a poet. He, he doesn't know about politics. It's personal for him. He's just a gay poet. Just like He him. had aware, an awareness of politics. Yeah. Only he's also the type of guy, like we said, we compared him to Oscar Wilde. He mythologized his life so much that in so doing, he makes it somewhat convoluted and, I think what the question you're asking, I'm not quite sure the answer. It's a worthwhile question to ask though, the degree to which he becomes this cultural installment, um, in his cooperation with the Nazis or, you know, how much he may or may not harbor those fees anyway. Or, or like, did he harbor them before and they just, or was he just a a collaborator for an occupying force and then just, or like, and then how it relates to this fucking movie. The one thing we also didn't discuss is the other weird connection between Labette and the Jewish moneylender is that they both are linked to the father through transactions and yeah. force him to pay his debt. It's very similar. It's very similar. Uh, and I think those comparisons are worthwhile. Both, both the Jewish moneylender and in beast here i think it's easy to overlook because of how majestic and otherworldly this that's the thing this yeah. design is but he's rich and they talk about his wealth a lot yeah it's how <laughs> it's how gaston dies at the end um i know that's not his name but still that's that's what disney made him um yeah but whenever like this that's that's my one problem with this is whenever this movie's like, oh, look how hideous I am. Don't look in my eyes. It's too horrible. I'm just like, buddy, come on. With all with with, with the suit and the 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 cute little fangs hanging down, <laughs> like you're not that ugly. You're you're, you're kind of cute. You look like I can boop your snoot. Are you saying you're a furry right now? What no, are you saying? No, I'm saying that like he's not like horrifically hideous. I'm saying that like. He's just kind of cute, honestly. He looks he looks like he looks like he's from Cats. Is basically what I'm saying. The Broadway play, not the. He does look field. like Cowardly Lion. Yeah, kind of. Sure. But also that that's Cowardly Lion is exactly the figure I was looking for, basically. But no, I mean, in in as far as that relates to the other ring of like, I don't know, the Jewish character. I think it is worth mentioning those that connection though is that they are both people collecting on their debt and, and perhaps that other scene would have added a version of complexity to this that feels missing from this one. Um, and then also as Dan Fishlin discusses in that chapter of that book or whatever, he talks about how like the way in which this movie seems to be distancing itself from the Jewish character 
it re- it revolves around the idea that you are accepting as a fundamental premise of your existence. Beast accepts that he's another in order to distance himself from the other other. You know what I mean? It's a not, I'm not like the other girls. I'm not like the other beasts, Max. Oh, I love the reverse shot. Whoop. Yep. Yep. But I, I do think all those questions are very interesting. And because of the way in which Cocteau makes his movies to be riding the line of that specific amount of obscurity to prevent you at arriving at certain conclusions. So you always have something to return to. I do feel like it's kind of hard to get genuine answers. I think you're just left with that feeling like, yep, it, it does use that Jewish archetype character. And would it have been different if that other scene was in there? I don't know, but that's, that's where I am. Is that it, it is sort of an anti-Semitic in that way. Yeah. <sighs> And yet again, no, very few movies <laughs> can age perfectly. Sure. Yeah. Sensibilities change and whatnot, but like you have to wonder why that's in there. Yeah. Cause it is specifically his invention and, and it, also because of the degree to which his movies are about biography and, and also, what that means. And it doesn't add anything. It, again, if it was part of more of the movie, it might add to something. Yeah. I can't quite recall why they decided to cut out the other version. Maybe it was, they felt like it was bringing down the flow of the movie or whatever. Um, but yeah. So all, all are worthwhile questions and I'm not quite sure of my precise answer. But that's what our audience is for. I'm sure you guys have the precise answer to our question. So let us know in the comments below. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know. Uh, we get more chances to see these incredible sets again, which I'm always happy about. And costume design. Do you want to talk about Jean Marais in this moment? Sure. What do you think of his performance? Um, <laughs> He's like, lapping up water yeah. <laughs> out of a stagnant pond, which he did for real. Really? He's not what I'd call a method actor. But, but he, he got really into it. He shares Pacto's like infatuation with with you being real in front of the camera as the only way of creating poetry. Okay. But uh, do you know when he started acting? I should have looked this up myself. This like, is a very interesting question with him. This is something people talk about with his performance style and also the way Cocteau likes to shoot him in the and frame him and everything and light him. Uh, He notably was not a trained actor. He did not get into the conservatory, but he was a hard worker and he still put in a lot of effort. And uh, when he first met Cocteau about, I think around 10 years prior to this, um, they started doing stage work together and he put in a lot of work and he embraced sort of alternative, very physical performance styles. I was going to say, cause it almost seems like a mixture of theater and silent film where like he is very articulate with every movement and like, yeah. make sure you see what he's doing and it comes across as campy to a degree, yeah. but it works in the favor of the character that they're trying to create. And it feels like the movie is aware that it's campy too, yes. is that it's getting this really, it, it somehow feels both, embracing camp without even going so far as to make it like outright humorous, except for certain moments. It, it makes it, it makes you smile. It doesn't make you laugh, but it's just like, Oh, <laughs> it's endearing. Yes. And also at the same time it manages. Okay. That's one of the outright, maybe more comedic moments where he's going to, he's reacting to the stag when they're talking. Um, however, it also shoots him in very heroic stature and framing and blocking a lot. And I think, I think it's very interesting. If you look at that, uh, another book that I think was very useful for researching this movie is just the French film director series. Um, I think from, I can't remember who put it, Manchester, Uni- Manchester press, I think who knows. Uh, but it's by James S. Williams. I'll link to it in the show notes. And he has a whole chapter about how Cocteau would shoot Murray in his movies. And it's very interesting. In this one, he's talking about like, you know, how, Marais heroic body Cocteau sort of really pays attention to it in the frame, but then formally it becomes something that is like 
relating to the way in which they are interacting with gender and then questioning this like heterosexual com- coupling is through, you know, Murray's body and his performance style. And also, frankly, the historical fact of what was going on during the set, Murray got sick. He had boils. Everybody had boils. Um, and uh, he had to put on this incredibly demanding outfit yeah. all day. All the makeup and all of the pomp. <laughs> Yeah, pompous royalty clothing. I'm not of as enough of an expert on like film outfits and makeup to really know whether or not this is true. But this seems like one of the earliest performances in film history where they it was one of those like surgically applied oh, things God. where they had to just do it layer by layer. Oh, look it at takes the, so look long. at this close up. Like it's really amazing. Yeah, because earlier films than this, you'd like see the lines and whatnot where like the makeup stopped and just like. <laughs> No, it's perfect. It's perfect here. Again, yet another really interesting uh, repetition of those motifs. She drinks. He drinks from her hands. Hands are very important in cocktail. They're sort of like, I don't know, instruments with which we work and, and create and act. That was also the first time we saw her in a position of power over him. She was shot, I think, for the first time in the movie at a low angle. And then we also have, uh, in that moment, the reflection of the water, another big thing. Cocteau is very interested in water and mirrors as gateways to things. That's the other reason why film is a really interesting poetic medium for him. Not only is it resurrecting in this sort of seance type way, think about it, film is like a mirror to another world. So they're on the other side of this mirror that we all watch when we gather together. Yep. Yep, so many mirrors. Uh, Here's the other interesting thing that I didn't mention earlier about looking at his aesthetic as a as a sort of seance thing because of what how that relates to the idea of death. He was sort of interested in death. That's why he did Orpheus so many t- times. Orpheus for him is like really like the mascot of like poetic expression because Orpheus uses his like musical, lyrical, poetic power to go through the underworld, which for him is like you are transcending because you have left the normal world behind and not even this, not even death can touch you. You can walk through it and you can walk right out. Of course, Orpheus makes the big fucking mistake of turning around, but that's, a, that's another thing. Um, fucking Orpheus. <laughs> fucking Orpheus. Why did you do that? You <laughs> stupid jackass. Um, but yeah, he, so that's another big part of this is that a lot of his movies become like, making himself into Orpheus. There's a reason why he provides so much biographical material, even if he obscures it to the point where you have to debate about what relates to what. Um, It's because he wants to, in a way that some critics have described as self-flagellating, which maybe at certain times that's true. I don't know if that's really true. Um, He wants to be vulnerable to himself as a poet. And then we all get to witness this but he's trying to express any anxieties he may have, um, any insecurities, thoughts, feelings, but address them honestly, which means opening himself up at least to his own self as an artist. And even if it's obscured for us, we can't be quite sure what, how he might feel about this or that. Um, and we were talking about him like he, he, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to talk about that moment that just happened there. Or like he's under pounds of makeup. And as he said, he was not a professional actor, but like that subtle moment where she's like scratching him behind the ears and he's like, Oh, you're rubbing me like an ant, like you would an animal. And she's like, Oh, you are an animal. Like there was an instant, just sort of like wave of sadness that sort of casually ran over his face at that exact moment that, I don't know, man. <laughs> if he's not a professional actor, that was very, very well timed, and he did, he's really throwing himself all into this and trying his best. But it's definitely a very specific type of performance, and I wish I was better with picking up on line delivery in French um, to truly understand how he's giving this performance. But it's clear that whatever advantages he might have had for this role by not being a more classically trained actor, Cocteau managed to take advantage of them because not only does the movie focus on him, he actually stands up to that challenge. Like he bears the interest of the camera very well, right? He's, 
he demands our attention. It's not just that the movie wants to focus on him. It's that the way he performs this role, he's worthy of our attention. Yeah. In ways that I think some people watch this movie and they might feel Josette Day as Belle is kind of like not as interesting or they, you know, leaves them a little bit cold in comparison. And I get that. If you're going into the movie expecting to relate to Belle. Yeah. Then I can see why you might be a little bit disappointed. It is really, it's important to remember when we watch this movie. And I think it's easy to forget this too. How much this movie invents what we think of when we think of the story of Beauty and the Beast. It creates so much of it. So it is also kind of hard to go back and watch this movie and remember that it's an origin point for a lot of this and that, you know, it's hard to pick and choose which taken for granted assumptions about this type of story are worth trying to set on, set on the side a little bit in order to appreciate the originality of what this movie was doing. Speaking of which, this is one of those moments we mentioned earlier, which are not in the original story where she totally rebukes him when he shows up with blood all over himself (laughs) at midnight. And then she goes, clean yourself up. And she throws a napkin at him. (laughs) So one other interesting thing I wanted to mention earlier, uh, specifically about that scene where his ears perk up when they're talking and he goes and pays attention to the stock footage of the deer uh, is how that relates to the pavilion of Diane, who is who I believe they're Artemis. I don't know who called them Diane. Maybe it was the Roman. It's a Demeter. It's um hunter goddess. Oh, well it is Artemis then, but I'm pretty sure I thought it was a statue of Demeter, but whatever. It's 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 the pavilion of Diane. It's a Greek God. Yes. Um, So what's the famous story with her? Um, She, oh yeah, Artemis. So her famous story is when that hunter like saw her bathing in the woods while hunting a stag or something and she turned him into a stag to be hunted forever. I mean, she shoots Ivanon in the back, turns him into the beast. Stags are all throughout this movie. What's up with that? Um, That's its own question. But the, the interesting thing about the stag here is how it relates to these two characters, Ludovico and Avignon. Because, as we mentioned, they're kind of presented as homosocial characters, and if you want more backstory on like the use of that term, I would recommend listening to our Sherlock Jr. episode, because I feel like we did a decent job of I mean, we talk it about, there. We talk about homosocial behavior a lot. It's, it's adjacent to homoeroticism. Yes. Um, it is a type of homogenous bonding. In the examples we've looked at it, it's between men. Uh, at the exclusion of difference. And it is not necessarily eroticized. Um, It's basically like a boys club atmosphere. Yeah. And that's sort of what Avignon and Ludovico kind of represent. They're rascals. Um, Avignon wants to engage with Belle, but she refuses him out of deference to her father. Um, So they're sort of stuck together and it feels sort of comedic in that, Commedia dell'arte way where they're kind of goofballs. Um, Which was played up in the Disney version. Um, and <laughs> however, it got to the point where uh, Disney got in some controversy with the most recent live action remake because they uh, said that the character of uh, LeFou, who in this one is, what is it? Ludvico or the brother? Yeah, the the shorter one. Um, his translation in the animated one is just LaFu, Le, the fool, who just is there to talk about how great Gaston is. And then the live action version, Disney's like, he's going to be the first openly gay character. In- oh, yeah. Well, that whole bullshit thing. Yeah. The queer baiting stuff. I mean, sure. I'm saying, yeah. I, I just felt like it was kind of a almost a <laughs> an evolution, but not really. It was no. just a. No version of it. Disney isn't interested in genuinely questioning no. anything. Um, but that aside, I, the point of bringing up the homosociality of those two characters is to relate it to the activity we're introduced to them doing, which is shooting arrows at the thing. And it does seem reminiscent of like hunting as this homosocial activity. Um, the hunting of stag. Uh, it's also the thing that we see beast introduced with. He's standing over the corpse 
of the deer that they tried so hard to get. Right before he demands a, a woman in substitution for the man that he's going to eat, right? Yeah. Um, I feel like the homosocial nature of hunting as it's presented in this movie, even though we don't see it happen, just the shooting of arrows, right? Relates somehow to the very conflicted dis- emotional distress the beast is in. Uh, the fact of him being under this curse because apparently his parents didn't believe in fairies is, is the explanation he gives, um, which maybe relates back to the introduction as well. Um, he's sort of cursed because they didn't believe in the power of this other world. Um, I don't know the hunting activity and the way it relates to a potential queer desire in like a society of men, right. That is outside this heterosexual union is interesting to me because it seems like through the relation of the hunting with the stag to then the beast who interacts and then notices those things, it seems to be related And, like, this is interesting because they never seem to be, like, romantically involved. It seems to just, like... There really is no romance. Yeah, it's just, like, him learning to be a person again more than, like, a beast. It's, like, them developing an actual friendship and just, like, her, like, stop self-pitying yourself. Stop apologizing for you being you. Go about your life. Stop, like, just accept yourself for who you are and I'll hang out here with you. It's, like... It's a very different dynamic than you would expect in this kind of story. Because it is not just going headlong into the romance plot. Yes. Um, It is very much about the fact that this doesn't quite work the way you think it should. In some ways, maybe that's enhanced by all the different iterations and expectations we have of this story now. You know, maybe the ambiguity of that plays even better now than it did. Right? Right. I don't know truly what the expectation of French audiences at the time would have been. Uh, obviously, I assume there would have been a general awareness of this story. Um, and that's another interesting angle we haven't really brought up yet. The idea that people tend to read this movie as a type of national allegory of sorts with the troubled family having to uh, deal with the problems that come with debt, with not getting along with one another. Um, the idea of sort of occupation of the space you're in um, dealing with, you know, the monsters who took control of you. Um, And, but also like the fact of part having to participate in it to get out of it. And then the idea of trying to, I don't know, achieve this sense of poetic unification that allows you to fly off into the ether and lives in, live in the magic world of plenty where France is united again people tend to look at this movie that way. France is still the most powerful society in the world. Well, also if you want to look at this movie through that lens, it's probably worth comparing um, it to some comments we made in our bicycle thieves episode, which that movie is dealing very much with the, with the uh, like results of the war on yes. ordinary oh, Italians. That, 100%. However, she has the infinity gauntlet. Okay. She sure does. Doesn't she? Yeah. Um, Sorry, the way she looks at the glove, she's just like, I have all of the power. It's magic. It does have power. Yeah. But yeah, so that movie, an interesting thing that with that movie is that it doesn't really address ideas of collaboration. In fact, it's like, it's almost like performing a magic trick where it's like, look at how miserable this is. I think we didn't collaborate. Don't forget that. It could be just mainly because like the Italians are like, hey, we already killed Mussolini. <laughs> like we, eh, maybe we, we dragged him out of his bunker and hung him on top of a gas station like. But the point is that's also an international type of movie. Yeah. Right. Art house movie. And it helped shape art house. It helped invent that market in some ways, but it is, it is something that is like not looking at collaboration. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> yes. And the fact of making a movie that is so much embracing the fairy tale aesthetic immediately after that is escapist. Let's go back to the innocence of our childhood. Let's not, talk about that in between period uh, between our childhoods and now um, let's have a Jewish character who seems to ruin France. Yeah. <laughs> our patriarchal leader. Oh God, he was taken down by this Jewish moneylender. I think, you know, 
that's another potential reading of it if you want to look at it through that more national national lens. However, even that doesn't really can't really become a coherent subtext of this movie because again, Cocteau isn't quite interested in France as much as his biography, right? So even if he is interested in those things, he's never going to choose one or the other, or if he is going to choose one, it's going to become a type of personal expression over everything. You got diamonds all over your face. (laughs) Oh God, get them out of there. So I don't think we really brought up the Freudian imagery. There's oh. not much to say because I'm not like super interested in going into it. I will say that uh, there's another piece I'll link to by a woman named Susan Hayward who goes deep into psych, uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis to talk about how their, the, uh, their romance or whatever is about breaking free of the symbolic order or whatever. <laughs> that's its whole other adventure, Lacanian psychoanalysis. That's a pain in the ass to read and understand. However... I do want to mention that Freudian psychoanalysis and the ability to work that into filmmaking, and also it's just general relation to the way surrealists like to make art, yeah, uh, is something that is just another one of those techniques. Cocteau would weave into this tapestry of this movie only to intentionally refute by obscuring it. He wants to give you as many things to latch onto as possible and then just not let any of them be the sort of key you can use to understand this map that is this movie. He is a hunk. (laughs) This apparently was the first thing they shot. (laughs) I wonder why. And they had to be very clever with it because they could barely find any sheets as well. They did not have as many as it looked like they had. (laughs) And of course, here we have yet another connection between the Jewish moneylender and Beast where, oh gosh, Belle is back and she's the one with the riches, right? Fuck. And by that, I mean, it's almost like, you know, it's almost as if, because she's going to give her family certain gifts or whatever, uh, even though it will transform into a snake as they touch it. Uh, it's almost like the father returning with the things that they were hoping for. Or not a snake, whatever the fuck that is. Clever editing right there. Yes. What do you think about the editing of this movie? Um, I think it's mainly very well done. I think a couple of the magic effects aren't done that well, like the magic glove transportation that we just saw. Was I think that's one of the better really? things. I, the things that are weird to me are the sudden cuts to black and then fade up. Okay. It's like what? Yeah, uh, maybe it's just because I'm used to that in old black and white movies for the most part, like especially like pre fifties. I would say mm-hmm. um, I'm just kind of used to. Oops, we have to do <laughs> that for this. So my usually brain. it's not quite like that, but that's also another intentional thing. I yeah. did uh, another fun detail about the production is exactly how much he. Um, I don't want to say chastised, but he he basically like. I don't know, hectored everybody on set who were very good at their jobs into trying to leave behind conventional modes, best practices, basically, where he was talking to um, the one I think of the most based on his diary is the cinematographer, Henry Alleken, who also did a really amazing job on this movie. Um, He was constantly badgering him, saying like, no, don't do this to make it look professional. I want it to be like, I just want to approach this like a talented amateur not a professional. So they were constantly going back and forth, uh, arguing about the lighting and the way the camera needed to be set up. But here's the thing. I don't think you can really argue with the results, frankly, because I think part of what makes this movie feel time, feel timeless is the fact that they're not interested in those conventionalized techniques of shooting things. And that extends to even if there's awkward edits. It's like, nope, this is what it's going to be uh, because this is decided. I decided this is the way the movie needs to be. Right? Yeah. I'm sorry. I keep getting caught up 
This is another one of those examples of I need to look at Austin's beautiful body and not the screen because otherwise I'll get caught up in the majesty of the movie. My beautiful beast body. Yes. Austin actually went full cosplay for this episode. We should have brought that up earlier. Yes, it's magical. It looks like it took him hours to put on all the makeup and the finery. It's like Tim Curry. It's really pointless since you can't see him. I don't know why I did it. (laughs) This is what happens when you're under quarantine. I guess I'll do this. Can I ask you, what do you think of the ending of this movie? (laughs) <laughs> it's not quite coming up yet, but she's going to return or they're now having seen the riches that she's bearing. Ludovico and Avignon are going to react. They're going to say, I want rich things. So, Oh, what? She's got a magic glove or something. Well, fuck it. Let's just rob this asshole. Yeah. And we'll take his shit, which by the way, yeah, another similarity. If they had kept in that other scene, can we save that for the ending? And sure. This, this kind of relates to it. Do we need both the set of jealous bitch sisters and (laughs) Avignon and the brother? Like, do we, they they seem like we could cut one of them, like one group of them, and they would serve the same purpose. Like, either you have the sisters who represent non-grateful, like those, the sisters are from the original story. No. Are they not? No. Okay. Well, yeah. They seem like they should be, honestly, of like what not to be in a woman. They feel more comic relief yes, than anything. But And also, actually, they make sense that they're in a mention of Cocteau. But when, like, we can either have the sisters, like, want to destroy her relationship with the Beast so they can get riches because their own actions caused the father to spend too much more than he had or whatever. Or we can have this, the brother gamble away all the father's work and he, him and his friend who wants to marry bell go and like try to fuck things over with the beast. Do we need them both is what I'm saying. Well, you have to keep at the very least Avignon and Ludov- Ludovico because they or Ludovic. Yeah. Um, They have that plot function. And I also think that's more important to the movie's central concern of masculinity, homoeroticism, homosocial relationships, um, specifically with the double casting of Jean Marais. Inner beauty versus outer beauty. Sure. Yeah. And also... um, Well, because it never... How how the movie, like, camera relates to them, too. It's good we pretended to like her for five minutes, so now she'll stay and the beast will die of a broken heart. I guess the question, too, of what you're talking about with which one you could cut out is the question of, like, I think it's more so these two characters, the sisters, right? Or, and like, they're, I know they're, like, supposed to be working toward a common goal, but, like, it does seem like they're separate. Like, their actions seem so separate for the majority of it. They seem completely alien from one another. I don't know. Well, it's just, could could it be potentially rewritten or redone in such a way as to make it feel less redundant? Does yes. it feel too redundant? Yeah. It's like, we get it. They're trying to screw, yeah, beauty. Okay, now we're going to get a scene of the guys trying to do it. Now the ladies are trying to do it and back and forth. But At the same time, I think their frivolousness somehow still reinforces the movie's interest on beast in, instead of like them. This movie is so not interested in its women that it seems to be like, I mean, it's more interested in bell, but it's so not interested in anything beyond her. And it's more focused on beast to the point where it's like, we're also more interested in the other man vying for bell than the sisters. Yeah. And it's true. (laughs) I love how he's supposed to be like trying to cheer her up. 
but it's just like this long one take of like I can just imagine John Cocteau is just like look at my boyfriend, look at his sparkling eyes. Look, that is kind of what he's doing. <laughs> They're giving him the sparkling eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just listen to him talk with his chiseled chin and jawline, chin and, face. Oh God. <laughs> Let's listen to him talk about murdering an animal. Uh, we have to cut to her. Let's have, let's blur her face a lot so we don't have to look at her. <laughs> Can I ask you what you think about her desire for Beast? Do you think she comes to accept and desire him? I think it's more just like, Her father's been nice to her, but like Beast is the only person who's ever given her things and like respected the boundaries that she's set up and met her on her terms and accepted them. Yeah. And I think she's just like, oh, people can be nice. So I think that's why like. And he's he remains the ideal. Yes. In a certain sense. Um, And that relates to actually a quote from that. Dan Fishlin essay I'll just read right now where he's talking about the beast. He says it, he's both an ambiguated ideal. And this is in parentheses, the prince is heteronormative and queer. And then the threatening lover Avignon, he's talking about Murray specifically yeah. um, by virtue of being played by the same actor. The beast condenses the anxieties and guilt circulating through these unstable forms of desire encoding by his slash her very difference the multiple configurations that complicate any notion of stable sexual identity. Thus, the queer dimensions of the multiple roles played by Murray as Cocteau's homosexual lover, the object of heterosexual desire as the beast, as Avignon, as Arden, which maybe is the name for the prince. Yes. Um, inflict the film with a potent emblem of fluid sexual identities that resist the simple categorization in the modes of mere hetero or homo or even queer normativity. The beast is at one level the imaginary other of the director, but she slash he is also an other. And the film suggests that this monstrous love can lead both beauty and the beast to a new humanity. One that leaves behind the troubled legacy of patriarchal family, the perversion of restricted forms of sexual identity and the disabling fear of all forms of difference, sexual or, or otherwise the beast, depending on the gaze constructing his or her presence is thus an ambiguous sexual construct, a queer especially in a reading that incorporates Cocteau's directorial eye into the context of the gaze that constructs the beast as an object of desire. From that perspective, the film, fan, the, the film's camera work becomes a sensuous point of contact between Cocteau and his lover, a way of framing their sexual relationship in a visual code that is unceasingly driven by the passion of the lover's gaze. At the level of signification, the beast becomes the very signifier of queer presence in the film, despite the not quite conventional heterosexuality figured in the denouement, which Cocteau was notoriously unhappy. It's, I agree with that 100%. It's, right. It's like what I was saying before, uh, way earlier on where it's just like this movie is 100%. <laughs> like it, it's, that's why it affects me so much it was because like it's a queer gaze it's, it's so like he said, like, if you take that approach to viewing it and I know it is important to look at movies through different lenses, but like, maybe it's just me, but like this movie struck me with like how much it's hard to not view it in that. Yeah. Through it, that lens. And As, yeah. Especially because of the way we discussed how you come to learn of this movie now. Yeah. You know, John Cocteau, you know, his, his biographical influence over the thing, things he makes. And you know that John Murray and him have this relationship, which makes it more interesting, but it really is about how this whole thing starts to become a little bit trapped. And there is a bit in that quote that was very long, but is about what they reference as perverse, desire within the patriarchal structure that refers to another thing people like to point out about this movie is, uh, from a vaguely Freudian sense, people harp on bells early fixation with her father as this sort of thing. That's like vaguely Oedipal 
in its in its context. Even before he falls ill, she's like, no, I can't marry you because I have to stay with my father. In the barest sense, she's not fulfilling her, like, her, I, I don't know, she's not inhabiting, like, sexual behavior out of deference to the parent, which from a Freudian perspective will always be vaguely Oedipal because it's about... It's about in one turn developing as the subjectivity by becoming se- sexually active while while also sort of refuting the parent. Yeah, but that's like like he gets sick later on. But he's, does he really need her? Also, why does she have to wait after her two bitches of sisters? I don't. Know. That's why people read it as her desire, yeah, not just a material circumstance that forces her hand. Things coincide to give her an alibi for her desire, but that's what people read into it. Of course, Jean Cocteau's thing that he does is that he doesn't want any of this to be too accessible as to be easily read, so he obscures it. He fills in other weird details, um, and he makes them convoluted, right? He, he basically... He forms too many alternatives. Like, how do the, all these things work with the different motifs, right? You can provide a very complex reading of it, like Susan Hayward in that essay, but then in order to do so, you are delving into the depths of Lacanian psychoanalysis, which her analysis makes complete sense. Yeah. But it's like, that's a very, very, very specific path you are taking to co- correlate a lot of different details. Um, that was a weird transition. Yeah, there's lots of weird transitions in this for sure. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And then she's what, a monkey? Honestly, I kind of like that one. Because that's just like a cute little monkey (laughs) wearing a bib or something. Yeah, she's lucky. She's not an old woman. Do you feel like the movie gets slower at this point? I do. Um, More because like. There's no reason that she should have stayed for this long. Like from all of her motivations at this point, it seems like she would have gone back because like the beast never said like, oh, this is the only time I'll let you go. It's this one time or nothing else. It's like. Spend a week with the beast and a week with the family. (laughs) You guys seem to be getting along pretty well right now. There's no reason this can't work out for you. So it's like a manufactured reason why she has to. Again, I think it does relate back to that desire. Yeah. She, it's a delaying action sort of, um, to the resolution or reconciliation of their romance. Right. And then she sees him dying. Um, but she has the conflicted desire where she is still part of this more, I don't know, heteronormative union um, with with Avignon in a certain sense because yeah. she does admit that she loves him and also uh, her father still in a certain sense. But Avignon at this point, I think more so. Of course, her hesitance here, I think, helps set up the ending, which I asked you earlier whether or not you you felt like it was ambiguous about the sort of happy ending because people like to point out how much it is so over the top in its ending. They, he turns into Jean Marais without the makeup in two seconds. And then suddenly we're flying off into fairyland and, uh, people point to that as something that is so over the top and engaging in that sort of campiness that it's like almost skeptical of it. It's like the ending of sunrise or, uh, the last laugh. In a certain sense. And um, I feel like one of the things they sort of key in on is a comment that she makes when he does transform back, expressing a type of ambiguity or disappointment in the fact that he no longer looks like the beast. And uh, I think it's because she genuinely commits to that othered romance in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. And then when he just goes back to looking like Avignon, it's like, oh, okay. 
People also like to, um, that's, that's a theme that carries over with the Disney movie though. It's cause they spent so much time making the beast horrific, but lovable looking that like they spent 10 sec. It looks like they spent 10 seconds drawing his human form. So it's like when he transforms into a prince at the end of the movie, you're like, can you, can you switch back? Well, in many ways it's like against the nature of the story Yeah, where it is about opening up this relationship to the other. And then they just transform back at the end. And it's like, you're now you're back at square one. And you're like, but wait, we just did all, like, the point is that she accepts him now. And now you just, it makes it seem like it was worth nothing. Yeah. In some ways. It's almost like a contradiction. But then you have her running down the stairs at that point, and she's taking possession. She screams, my beast, where is my beast? And one thing critics like to point to is, uh, uh, apparently, I don't know, this is probably apocryphal, but uh, something Greta Garbo said... <laughs> Uh, when he transformed where she was very irritated and wanted her beast back as well. Uh, those swans were furious, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I can see them in the background. Rock, can you see rock. the fact that they tied fishing string around their neck to keep them from destroying Jean Marais? <laughs> no, I cannot. I think they tried it without it, and they, like, attacked the shit out of him. <laughs> well, swans are just prettier geese, and geese are fucking pieces of shit. So, I feel like up? swans are more evil than geese. Swans are deceptive. I'll take care of that later. Of course, now it seems that, uh, it seems that Avignon and Ludovic are going to transgress against the pavilion of Diane, a sort of repetition of that, of that story about Artemis, right? Where she turns the, uh, Hunter into a stag because she's going to shoot Avignon in the back. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Of course. Why did you steal the key if you're not going to use it? I think they don't want to surprise them. They also got to be badasses. Real men go in through the ceiling <laughs> anywhere. Real men get impaled by statues. You know, what's funny about that, Max, is that that's yet another weird thing that they they couldn't really figure out how to do, so they just decided to do it for real. <laughs> I swear to God. That's one of the most underrated lines in the movie, by the way. What? I'm not scared. I'm just thinking. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. But yeah, what's about to happen here is Jean Marais is going to start climbing down like a trellis, and then the statue is in a very beautifully choreographed move. Like everything else in this movie, it's well-designed and the setting is beautiful. It's going to turn slowly towards him and shoot an arrow into his back. And what they did was Jean Marais was actually just standing on the trellis, and someone shot a fucking arrow in his back, and they had a giant cork board stuffed under his shirt. They just fucking shot an arrow at him. Jesus Christ. Your lead actor. No. The tragic final lines. If I were a man, I could do as you say. and Get back up. But I can't. I'm a cat. <laughs> Jellico cats. <laughs> no more. I'm. Can we, listeners, vote in the comments. Let us know. Should Max be allowed to talk about m m cats for the next month? Should we um, have a moratorium? If 100% of you respond that I'm allowed to talk about cats. We'll do cats within the next month. If all of you say no, I will never mention cats on the spectator film podcast again. You don't have to do that. It's just, no, I, I don't think we need to talk about it. We don't need to relitigate the value of cats. I think we do. I call it feline distancing project or whatever. Hey. <laughs> this is not related to anything, Max, but I found a stray cat that's coming around the house now. I'm trying to be friends with it. As it keeps should. jumping over the river, right? Right, like behind, right? Um, there's a path of rocks that it takes. Oh, that's beautiful. It's supposed to be snow. It's just it's just feathers from pillows, I think. But it's supposed to be snow, but it oh, still looks amazing. I always, the stuff took, falling. I always took it as petals. 
It also looks like petals, but I do believe kinda, it's supposed to be snow. That was supposed to. Ooh. Oh. Yes, this weird transformation fade where Jean Marais Avignon is going to become the beast now that he's been shot. And the other thing about this Susan Hayward essay is talking about how hey. how this transference right here is like somehow a a queer form of transference between two men. Yes. And here we have the famous reaction where uh, she's like, I don't know about this. So what do you think? What do you think about this moment? Do you think this movie co-signs on the happy ending or is it ambiguous? It's ambiguous because like <laughs> he literally, it is kind of a body swap thing. Um, he says, what's wrong? Wait a minute. Don't you look like <laughs> the lead actor of this movie? It is interesting. It's, it is this sort of switcheroo that I think the movie acknowledges in a way that other beauty and the beast adaptations don't seem to, or bridegroom movies. I'm trying to think of other ones, but they don't seem to really, um, acknowledge it in this way where they still fly off into the sky so you have your happy ending on a more superficial visual level. Um, however, you do have this undertone of dissatisfaction with what has just happened, which I think also relates to the idea that it's like, and they talk about it for a solid like 30 seconds, right? Yeah. Um, I do think it sort of relates to the idea of trying to escape this patriarchal heteronormative union and then su suddenly through this magic they wind up right back at it and when he asks if if she's happy she says i have to get used to it she was used to it before she grew out of it and now unfortunately she has to get used to it again it does feel kind of tacked on Mainly, I, I, I nef I've never had a problem with it before because I just kind of loved his foppish outfit that he shows up in. I mean, the outfits are great, yeah. Um, so I was busy looking at that. I do like how the sisters have to get turned into faces in the fireplace for all of eternity until they learned their lesson. But, um, Well, that comment is interesting, too. He says, your father will be there and your sisters. And it's like, yeah. so we're going back. We're going back. <laughs> We're going back to that place. Okay. And we'll, and we'll finally have achieved the sort of like, you know, land of plenty fairy tale where we live this luxurious life with all the resources that we were going to have. If only father's ships had arrived and not been destroyed in the storm. Right. It's almost just like a fulfillment of what happened at the beginning, which is why people look at it as a kind of maybe ironic ending because it so emphasizes the fact that the beast is not part of it now. It's just handsome Jean Marais I and mean, money. How you? How can you complain? There's different. There's three different kinds of Jean Marais in this movie. <laughs> Take your pick. Yeah, long haired, short haired, or beastly, or flying through the sky, <laughs> Jean Marais. I will say this. It. People talk about how this looks kind of like half-assed compared to the other stuff too. I don't know. It's still fine to me. The cloudy image. I still think it looks fine. It's fun. Um, but yeah, that's, that's Beauty and the Beast. We barely even talked about the opium stuff. <laughs> Unfortunately. I mean, it does relate to some of his aesthetic. It's an interesting thing where Jean Cocteau was an uh, opium addict. and uh, Who he, hasn't been at one point? <laughs> I, I, of course. Um and uh, that's what he sort of relates to the sort of change in pace and time that he can achieve by slowing down film or um, showing more frames per second, slow motion, right? People sort of look at it as a vague type of opium experience as okay. well in different moments, can, which can maybe change the way you read 
emphasis on different scenes as well. We also didn't really mention uh, George Auric, I believe is the name of the composer, but I think the music, even though it might be bombastic at different points, is still pretty solid. Oh yeah, because bombastic doesn't suit this at all. But I don't know. I think it. It. I. I think in certain moments it, may, it might feel a little bit weird, but it, I, I think now it helps. No, this real quality. I always have really enjoyed the music of this yeah. movie, and was kind of disappointed when I realized we would have to watch it with the sound almost entirely off for today. But, but yeah, um, it's just one of those movies that I think is very elusive. It's very significant in film history. There's a lot more to be said about it. There's so much material about it in the show notes that we'll link to. And we could do it again. Who knows? Yet again. We're never sure. we're never done with movies. Um yeah, there's there's a lot left to be said about it, and that's partly by design. But I'm glad we got an opportunity to talk about it because it's such a unique movie. This no, I'm this is, it's been so great to finally get this off the table yeah but. so uh yeah we may do more of cocteau's movies in the future and if you want to find out if we do that or not uh you can check spectatorfilmpodcast.com or find our episodes on spotify itunes or stitcher uh we also have that letterbox account which i never remember the name to but just go to our website and you'll find a link to it and uh yeah anything else max no one fights like Gaston. No one oh fights God, like Gaston! I thought we did a good job not bringing up the Disney one. I know, much. and it's the end of the episode.